So let's do an investigation of time. Take a moment to think about what you were doing 10 minutes ago. Just briefly review it in your mind. Now think about what you were doing this morning. What was the first thing you remember happening when you got out of bed or when you woke up? Just kind of review that with your mind, the visual experience of it, or maybe it's a narrative. Now bring it right up to what happened right before you started watching this video. What were you doing? Okay, now let's look at what you're gonna be doing when you're done watching this video. Had you already planned it out? If you hadn't planned it out, is it there? Now, just imagine, what might you be doing 10 minutes from now? 20 minutes from now? What are your big plans for later in the day? If you're watching this at night, are you imagining going to bed? How about tomorrow? What will you be doing tomorrow? How about next week? What kinds of things will you be doing next week? Are you traveling? Are you working? Do you have some big event you've been looking forward to? So when we look at time in this way, when we look through the timeline that feels like our life, just notice where we're putting our attention. We're putting our attention in thought. If you don't have aphantasia, a lot of that is probably visual. If you do have aphantasia, it might just be narrative. Narrative descriptions of what you were doing or what you will be doing. But either way, our attention's in thought. Now what's interesting is when you're doing this, does presence disappear? Presence meaning what's here right now. And not even the objects that are here right now. And not even just the awareness that's here right now. But the here-ness, the now-ness, whatever it is. It's ineffable. It hasn't gone anywhere. Did it change when attention was in a memory of the past? Did here go away? Or was it obscured? Does it seem like there was less attention in the here, in the presence? Or was the quality of attention different? How about in the future? Do you notice that the flavor of the future feels sort of like the flavor of the past in that it's thought stuff? It's made of conceptualities, narratives, images? So the whole past and the whole future are really the same stuff. They're rearranged memories and perceptions and beliefs about who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. But do you notice you don't need any of that now? There's something here that's just not that. It doesn't need that. There's something here that doesn't need to orient to the past at all. It doesn't even feel like it came out of the past. When you imagine what you were doing five minutes ago, ten minutes ago, two hours ago, it has a feeling like something is extending out from the past into right now that feels like you, right? Like that's your past, your memories, your timeline. But do you notice that when you just put your attention in presence, not contemplating thoughts about the past, there's something that doesn't feel like it came from anywhere. But it's definitely here. It didn't come out of the past because it can't access the past because there is no past. There's thoughts, but here, this presence, this moment, this ineffability, but undeniability, call it an experience of aliveness. Call it an experience of knowingness. Or don't call it anything at all. But just recognize it didn't come from somewhere. It's not going anywhere. 
So what are the implications of this that's not coming from somewhere and not going anywhere? Well, you could make implications in a conceptual way. You could start building a philosophy out of it, a metaphysical world. You could build doctrine out of it, but that's more thoughts. What would be another orientation or another way of regarding this? Well, one would just be reverence, natural enjoyment. Enjoyment for its own sake. We don't have to make it mean something. We don't have to collect information about it. We don't have to turn it into something. We don't have to record the experience to talk about it later to ourselves or others. This is a funny one because I, I hear it a lot, just in the nature of this kind of pointing I do. People report experiences, which is fine, but it's funny that we have such a strong tendency to do that, to stand back from an experience and record it so that we can report it later instead of just experiencing it. How often do you do that? Why? Is it necessary? So maybe we can orient to this by regarding it as completely self-fulfilling, self-validating, self-enjoying. There's nothing to do with it or about it, including record it. Now I understand this puts the mind on tilt. The mind's probably going, what, 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 what's he talking about? Or what, this doesn't make any sense. Or maybe your mind went quiet, which is perfectly fine. But what I'm pointing to is that there's something here. There's a possibility, a way of being that just doesn't require any conceptualization at all. It doesn't require thought at all. So another way of regarding this other than with just a sort of natural enjoyment is that it's a lens, but not the kind of lens of the mind, not a filtering lens. It's a, a sort of lens to deeper insight a portal or a catalyst to deepening insight. Insight here does not mean conceptual insight. It means immediate, direct realization. So what are you required to do to allow that catalyst to function? Just stay here. Don't do anything. Allow it to carry you deeper. Allow it to carry you inward allow it to carry itself deeper into itself. This knowingness, this pure aliveness with no particular quality, with no need for a definition or meaning or purpose. It is its own purpose. So we just remain here in the timeless. It's also called the eternal, which sounds all mystical and magical, but eternal just means not in time not bound by time, not defined by time. And then we realize how much we, the sense of being a me, is tied into time. A mental me, a separate me, a struggling me, a suffering me. It's all time bound, thought bound. So here we're free of that right now. This is what freedom means doesn't mean an emotional state. It doesn't mean a certain set of conditions. It means you're in direct contact with the unconditioned, that which cannot be conditioned. It doesn't take on any condition, including duality, including temporality. Isn't that nice? So the sense world might become more clear, obvious, and non-dualistic here. Sounds, feelings, sensations, the visual landscape may start to look quite different, feel quite different, sound quite different, more immediately alive. It might even surprise you because you didn't realize what it was. What we think sound is 
and what it actually is are different. What we think we see and what is actually seen are quite different. But when you don't put an overlay of time, of me, of need, of pushing, pulling, then it can naturally reveal itself. It might seem like it's both inside and outside. Both qualityless and also accommodating of inequality. But that can sound complicated. This is not complicated at all. Just simple. Just don't move from the vividness, the indefinability, the immediacy, and the non-locatability. It's right here for you, always. It's so close that you can't even be said to discover it or even enjoy it, really. You sort of need to stand apart from something to judge it. This is something that nothing can stand apart from. Apartness does not exist here. It's also not needed here. So timelessness is always a good entry point. First, remind ourselves of the feeling of time and the implications of believing that timeline and then see what's never been on that timeline. It's right here, always. <laughs>